for better or worse, the music industry does not want to hear your excuses. Like yeah. <laughs> straight up, it yeah. does not want to hear your excuses at any point in time. So it's like, oh, if you wanted to be a journalist, why aren't you a dry journalist? If you wanted right. to be in music yeah. marketing, why aren't you doing some marketing? If you want to manage an artist, you better go find an artist to manage. You know, there's no like yeah. do the thing that you said you're gonna do because literally I would tell people, like, I remember and like again, for better or for worse, I would, you know, I've worked in major labels. And I would talk to people and they were like, yeah, I started as an intern and they offered me a full-time job. So I just quit school. So right. that person is like 19 years old. With, she's like, like 21 years old with like three full years of industry experience at a major label because they were just like, cool, I'm, I want to do this thing. I'm going to do this thing now. Welcome back to Where Are All My Friends. This week's episode is with Christine Osazawa. And there are so many reasons that I love this episode. But she just has this story that's so relatable and inspiring of being a genuine fan of music and doing anything she could to carve out a lane and really use all of her unique skills to have the perfect career in music. And the amount of pivots that that took was crazy. A couple moments where I was literally on the edge of my seat. but hearing her story and hearing her explain it and hearing her share all of those experiences and the advice came together in the raddest way where I feel like if you're a veteran in music, you'll love it and you'll relate. Or if you're listening to this for the first time and you're trying to really find how to get your foot in the door, you're going to learn so much. So with all that said, let's get right into it. I loved this one. Where are all my friends? Christine Osazawa, and I'm pretty stoked on this. Big shout out to our mutual friend, Nick, for connecting this piece. I think there's gonna be a lot to talk about in this episode. I, th I think I barely know your story, but you've been a part of connecting a lot of really cool pieces and building something special as far as community and music, and I'm a big, big advocate of that. So thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to have this chat. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be really cool. Um, yeah. And again, too, like there's so much of your story that I don't know that I'm going to learn in real time. But just from the high level of what I do know, uh, you've done a lot of pretty cool shit in music <laughs> and you're from the States living in London. Like you've you've definitely done a lot and traveled a lot. And I always love talking to people that have that have real life experience. So for a listener who doesn't know you uh, quickly, before we get into the story, tell everyone who you are and what you do. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So hi, everybody. I am Christine Osazawa. Um, like was mentioned, I am a immigrant abroad. I live in London. Prior to this, I live in Stockholm. And I work for a company called Pollen as their strategy director. We are a live music and travel experience company. Um, and I also run a conference called Measure of Music, which is about music, data, and access to the music industry in that space, essentially. That's me. Fancy. That's like a, that's an adult introduction right there. If, if I met you somewhere and you said that, I'd be like, oh, wow. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that you have a very relatable story of like a humble beginning of like you started as just a fan of music, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I come from Baltimore. That's where I grew up. And um, it's funny because like, you know, Baltimore is not really the epicenter of the music industry by any stretch of the imagination, but like that's how I got my start. Um, and I wouldn't be where I was if it wasn't for Baltimore. Um, so I feel like it's my, one of my favorite places in the entire world still. Um, but yeah, I started as a super fan. Um, and I got, I didn't, I booked my first show at 15. Um, wow. and it was my 16th birthday party. Um, <laughs> this was in the age of my super sweet 16. Um, and oh, I yeah. decided to book a a basement church show instead, which is kind of somehow the antithesis and exactly what my Super Sweet 16 was at the exact same time, right? Um, I took a limo there still. Um, <laughs> that's how I got my start. <laughs> my poor parents, my poor, like, you know, Nigerian immigrant parents were very confused by the entire thing, but they were very Holy kind shit, and understanding. Taking a limo to a basement <laughs> show that you basement booked. Basement church like show the that I booked best myself. Best combination yeah. of everything there. I love that imagery yeah, so much. Mm -hmm really on brand for me like in hind like now in hindsight it's very on brand for me because I literally like really bougie things but like I grew up as a kid going to warp tour and so yeah. like you know that combination is just always in me at all times so I always tell people I always joke don't let the blazers fool you whenever I'm at work because it's definitely like I'm an emo kid at heart oh my um, god it's really, I like love nice it. things 
<laughs> I love it now too because you find like the like the veteran emo kids. Like we're oh, all yeah. in disguise now, right? Like everyone's all professional and <laughs> has like the clean cut haircuts and like you know like we all have like the fancy jobs. And then like there's like this weird secret handshake where you're like, yeah. oh, warp tour. Like that one word or email. one band yeah. will be said, and then it's just this rabbit hole where it's like, oh, you too. And it's like, yeah. I don't know, there's a real bond and understanding because that was such a community and like that was such a oh, formative, yeah. special thing beyond just the music. So that's you. That was that was your beginnings. That, that was, was your inspirations. And, and that was it. Yeah. It's so funny because um, like I said, I just joined this company now and we just did an emo night experience in Vegas. And it was so, so cool. I didn't get to go because I literally started like the week it happened or something like that. But we were like doing a retrospect and they're like, ah, oh, yes, the emos. I'm like, yes, I am a fellow emo. <laughs> um, and, and, like, I had to like self-identify in the room. <laughs> Later on, we get like the license plates, you know, like the veterans and all that, how you get like the special license plate. Like later one. on, 50 years later, we get like a special, yeah. <laughs> exactly like my little my favorite um my favorite slack emoji is like the little emo hair smiley face one with like the bangs um and that's how you know you're now an adult when you have a favorite slack emoji um yep. but it's used often <laughs> holy shit god that's too real so tell me though so like early days baltimore there isn't much of a music scene no. you book that show is it a band that i would have known or was it like very diy yeah so it well i mean it's thing about it it was very DIY and I always tell people this and I always say it sounds more impressive now than it was back then but this was 2006 so All Time Low was the headliner because they are from my hometown um wow. they're about two years older than me <laughs> and from the town I grew up in essentially so they were just like the kids down the street and they were the biggest band in Baltimore at the time you know the biggest shit. pop punk band in Baltimore so I booked them with five other great artists and great bands um and it was my sold out, you know, sweet, sweet 16 with, I don't know, 400 people, maybe something Holy like that. Shit. Like, <laughs> well, um, I, <laughs> that's crazy. Cause there's so much that in that where I'm like, oh my God, because like, I feel that so well. Cause like my early start to music was touring with a band. And I remember being on the other side of it, of fans of music in specific cities, hitting us up being like, yo, will you play my 16th birthday mm -hmm. party? And as a band, it was sometimes kind of a rad gig because it was fans that you would have never made otherwise mm -hmm. because 400 people are, you know, like to, to you as the, the birthday party holder mm -hmm. and booking agent, I say that with quotes, um, right you like you're bringing in a whole new fan base there mm -hmm. so i remember us being stoked to play things like that but it was also like it's so interesting because i've heard people talk about that and getting like the diy promoter start and it starts this bug and it just like is the introduction to the music industry so is that what happened oh, yeah. like what happens from there because clearly yeah. you paid it you had a pulse on the local scene if you found all time low in 2006 <laughs> yeah yeah no it was great um it's funny because like in hindsight now there's so many artists that like I booked or I work with that now like there's not very many that you know went on to be as famous as all-time low but like they're all writing songs now and they're all you know doing things in the space that are like really impressive musicians so it was really exciting to kind of see it progress but yeah so I did that um and I ended up booking a few more shows as well but the thing that took up most of my time is that I ended up running a magazine so I ran a magazine from 2006 to gosh 2011-ish called wow. Dean Trash Magazine and it was about <laughs> local music in various parts of the East Coast. So it started in just Baltimore, expanded to like Virginia and then it went to like Pennsylvania, Philly. But then by the time I was done, five years later, I had writers in, gosh, everywhere from Boston or something like that. You no, know, New York down to Florida, basically. So I had a staff of 12 writing a print magazine. And this was like live journal, you know, live journal days, right? So I really loved like punk DIY, like zine culture. So I was like, no, I wanted to be print because I love live music and I wanted something to sell at shows because I had an excuse to go to shows and work. Oh, <laughs> sick. So I read this magazine, yeah, for like, we did like, oh gosh, like, I don't know, 30 or 40 issues. And we had like, like we had local bands and then like, like mid-level bands. And we interviewed like every, like basically all the Warped Tour kids. We interviewed all of them. So like the covers were like Valencia, but also I had a cover like Mayday Parade. I had a cover well All Time Low. You know, oh I had like the so Gambit. Um, back, you know? yes. <laughs> it was really, really fun. I did that for years. And like, that's when I ended up, my undergrad degree was in um, music business. My school, again, not a music industry, like, 
beacon that Baltimore was. My school didn't have a music business degree. So thankfully, my school had this thing where it lets you create your own degree program. It was so much work. You had to like put together like every component of it. But I put together my own degree program. So my major ended up being music business and journalism because at the time I ran a print magazine basically about music. So I figured it seemed like a good route to go down essentially. And that's kind of like how I got my initial ends. And I ended up like literally the thing about it is like because there was no music industry. I always tell people when they come to me and they're like, Christine, you know, I think want to get in the music industry. And I'm like, just get in the music industry. Um, there's a lot of yeah. gatekeeping, a lot of barriers for entry. But yes. also the thing that makes it easy and hard is that anybody can work in the music industry. So like I emailed people, like cold emailed though, like there was one company in my town and they sold concert tickets to a competitor, Live Nation and Ticketmaster. They mm-hmm. were never like, they were a great company, but they weren't like, you know, VC fund or anything like that. Literally yeah. what happened was, Ticketmaster AEG came to town and they, you know, were like, hey, we want to, you know, work with your venue, et cetera. And Baltimore is full of like DIY punks and like working class folks. And they're like, we're not going to sell out to Ticketmaster. And so this company ended up just being like the people that were the alternative to Ticketmaster, essentially. So I emailed them when I was in college. And I was like, hey, I really love your company. Can I do anything for you? <laughs> and I ended yeah. up working for them part time while I was in college. And then that was my first full time job when I finished school, essentially. So the like there wasn't that much live, there wasn't that much music in Baltimore, but I just like identified anywhere that I could work. And I ended up working at radio stations, music venues. I actually contracted for, I worked for a marketing company that was contracted by Atlantic Records when I was like 20 or something like that. But it was based yes. in Baltimore. The marketing agency was based in Baltimore. And so I just did any possible thing that I could find in the music industry while I was in Baltimore, because I ended up going to undergrad in Baltimore as well, basically. So that's kind of how I got my start, just doing anything to work in music, basically. (laughs) You just said so much there that I so deeply relate to, because it's like, it can be gatekeepy. And that's like literally why I started this podcast, because I think that's so fucking stupid. But on the positive side of it, anybody can work in music. Mm -hmm. So on one side, you have people that are like all precious and gatekeepy about it. And you're like, well, that's lame. And then on the other side, it's like one day you can wake up and decide I'm going to work in the music industry and then just start sending a shit ton of emails and (laughs) maybe land something. Mm -hmm. So my question is kind of a two part question there, but it's like one, what did you, I guess I'll start. What did you learn from that? Like looking back at that now in hindsight, Like you probably didn't have some crazy strategic master plan. It was probably you just being excited about music. But like, what is that lesson that you learned from that? Because I feel like there's a lot there that you'll probably carry with you forever when you learn that grit. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, like, I think one of the things like like looking back on it, first of all, I, I lived, breathed and slept like music even when I was really young. And so something like it was something like there's a very inherent part of me that knows that like the happiest place I'm in is when I'm working in music. And so I always know that like that is the North star that I always have to be no matter how annoyed I am on the day of or whatever it might be. It's like, that's, that's the place that I love the most and like the willingness to do absolutely anything um, to my detriment um, is uh, something yeah. that I brought with me um, because I was joking. I was like, I wish I loved like thinking as much as I love music. God, or right? I very sometimes talk to, way less yeah. <laughs> You talk to certain people that have like, uh, I'd like say regular careers, but like yeah. that just have a lane carved out and it seems so blueprinted. Like you're like, oh, you just yeah. do this, this and this and you stay determined and you stay on that path and then you're good and you're like, must be nice. Lawyer. Yeah. And then you're <laughs> yeah. a doctor and those are all the steps. Oh, like you take these steps and then you were just that thing. And I'm like, am I really a music industry professional? You know, I'm like, you know, I think we all feel that like that FOMO or in, that. I'm like, yeah, I think I work in the music industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, the, I said FOMO. I mean like imposter syndrome. Like, yeah, yeah, everybody has that. Yeah. It's crazy. And so like looking back on like growing up and things like that, I think it was just kind of like this like sheer determination to do the thing that I said that I was going to do that kind of was like driving me forward at all times. And so when I talk to people, I always tell them and it's like, Again, it sounds really gatekeeping. It's also like a symptom of how odd the music industry is. But I always mm-hmm. tell people, I'm like, if there's anything you love, even as close to as much as you love music, go do that thing. Um, I don't know what it yeah. is. Anything you love, go do that. Yeah. If the only thing that you love is music, then you're going to have to stick it out essentially because it is, it is, I always say sometimes that, you know, you have days where like when you're not in the music industry, you're really bummed out about it. But also when you're in the music industry, you're also really bummed out about it. <laughs> and so like you have to like really want this because there's really high highs and really low lows. And I learned that really early on because I started booking, like I started interviewing, I was a journalist essentially. I mean, like for my own zine, but I was a journalist at 
16. So I started interviewing people when I was 16 years old. And like, I've had very high highs and very low lows because of that really early on. And so like, if there was any point in time I wanted to do something different, I, I should, could have made that decision lots of times um, yeah. and still just decided not to, which that's something about me, I suppose. Um. <laughs> no, but like I do, I think I feel that as well. And I think the people that hear that and relate will relate because it's like, mm-hmm. well, my, my the second part of the question was, do you think that that, that route is still viable this day? And what I was going to say is like, I think that if you feel that drive, you kind of just have to, and you have to figure out what you can do to be involved. And you just like, there's not really a blueprint, but you just got to do it. And every day you got to be involved and whatever. But what do you think that blueprint looks like in 2021 and 2022 yeah. like obviously i don't really i mean sure you can start a zine but i don't know like it doesn't feel like the same time and it seems like <laughs> doesn't it seem like some of the fundamentals are the same but there's also such a different landscape like what do you yeah. think like what's that look like now to get involved like in your first year of music industry right now like is that still the same path yeah so i think it's funny because i always joke and i talk to a lot of people in the industry now especially a lot of people i want to get into the industry but i always joke that i wish there was as many routes in now as there was like as when i was a kid because now it actually feels like there's so many more options there's incredible companies out there that are just building companies just to help people get into the music industry so you can be you know you can be writing for various publications you can be you can be like on street teams you can be doing all kinds of things there's some really amazing women at this company called Fan Made. Um, it's started as Fan to Band. And all they like what they do is they bring in fans to help on different like campaigns. They use them as street teamers. They do all this amazing stuff, for example. There's another company called Digilog, and they do like educational pieces and like job postings and like they put together conferences. Like there's all these different spaces. Like there's another woman, uh, Sherry Hughes. She has this incredible newsletter in this community she's built around that. And she has like writers, like, like some of the greatest music journalists, music writers that can write about music and tech that she brings in to write for her publication. So there's all these like, like roots in now that are just kind of yeah. literally built to help people get in in a way that like when I was growing up, you had to do the whole thing yourself. It felt like there was no like root in. It was like, cool, you figure it out. And yeah. now it's like there's all these routes in, which is amazing. And I actually love that because it feels so much more like a community. Like I mentioned certain people, or I mentioned certain things, like everyone else is like, oh yeah, I know so-and-so. Or, oh, I've talked to that person. I'm like, this is super cool. And like, I didn't, I don't think it was quite the same when I was growing up, which I actually find really amazing. So like in a lot of ways, it feels easier than it was when I was younger. Um, and I love that actually. I love this community that's being built basically. No, that's really cool. That's actually a really good point. And I think like we were talking right before we started recording a little bit about a dear friend, Johnny Minardi, who you were under the same company umbrella for a second there. And I think that was the first episode of the podcast that you had heard, which is so cool. But I can't help but think back to him. Like he's been like great inspiration and advice to me, but he's also like kind of like tough love where like (laughs) even with this podcast or like when any endeavor, anything that I've started he's like kind of just like just fucking start it like start it what are you doing go do it it doesn't matter if it's perfect go do it Mm -hmm. and I think that probably still holds up because like back in your story you started the zine you started interviewing people you started emailing to get that job at a radio station or anywhere and I think that those avenues are probably different now and now there's more resources like all of the ones you just mentioned being incredible ones uh But I think that that's got to be the same, right? Of just like starting it. Like if you feel passion towards it, like maybe instead of a zine, it's a YouTube channel now, or maybe Mm -hmm. instead of calling and emailing radio stations, you're hitting up these resources that you just mentioned. But Mm -hmm. I think that that probably stays the same, right? Of just like start it. Yeah, there's that grit of like the music industry does not like for better or worse, the music industry does not want to hear your excuses. Like yeah. straight up, it yeah. does not want to hear excuses at any point in time. So it's like, oh, if you wanted to be a journalist, why aren't you a dry journalist? If you wanted right. to be in music yeah. marketing, why aren't you doing some marketing? If you want to manage an artist, you better go find an artist to manage. You know, there's no like, yeah. do the thing that you said you're going to do. Because literally, I would tell people, like, I remember, and like, again, for better or for worse, I would, you know, I've worked at major labels and I would talk to people and they were like, yeah, I started as an intern and they offered me a full time job. So I just quit school. So right. that person is like 19 years old with, she's like, like 21 years old with like three full years of industry experience at a major label because they were just like, cool, I'm, I want to do this thing. I'm going to do this thing now. Like, yeah. Just do the thing. Um, and it's a pain. And it's a, like, 
you have to have like the thing about it is I think it's really interesting about the music industry is one of the it's a component of the music industry that allows you to like there's a component of the music industry that has no gatekeeping Mm -hmm. that allows you to just go ahead and do the thing you want to do without very many resources which I think is very very cool because like for example if you wanted to work in fashion you would need all of the you know the clothing and paying for all these things stuff like that but if you want to work in music you find your friend down the street who happens to run, you know, be in a band and then you go out on tour with them as their tour manager. Right. Like you just do the thing. (laughs) Yeah. Like there's not really like a cost to entry. And it's funny, but yeah, no cost in and of itself. (laughs) And as you're saying it in real time, like I kind of am realizing like a thought of like there, anybody can work in the music industry, but this whole idea of like, we'll just do it and start. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's even a deterrent at times because maybe it's almost like when you're on the outside looking in, Mm -hmm. you feel like you need somebody's permission or authority or Mm -hmm. somebody to officially say start or this is your new role. And I think that that's maybe something that even I struggled with in the beginning was it was like, oh, fuck, like I just have to kind of say that I'm doing this and do it one day. Even with this podcast, like I didn't fucking I didn't know anything about podcasts. Like one day I was like, oh, I, I have these microphones. I guess I just have to hit record and whatever. So it's like it's interesting that maybe the biggest gatekeeper in the beginning is just the re- like the lack like of realization that it's just right? like you just have to go no one's going to give you yeah. permission yeah which it's weird which is like can be daunting right it can be yeah. super daunting to think about it where you're like oh like i remember when i started my magazine i'm like oh i guess i'm a journalist now you know and i'm sending <laughs> emails to like you know p- like publicists and stuff like that and i'm like hey can i interview so and so and like the thing about it the thing that i found really interesting about the music industry and even to this day in a lot of ways um, is that people say yes a lot, which I find really <laughs> cool. <laughs> that's so funny because that's actually right? true. Like people will say yes, and I'm like, I like, and like the only thing you could do is just shoot your shot, right? And so I remember, yeah. like, like I interviewed like Cobra Starship at the height of popularity of Cobra Starship, and like I just happened to email. God, I guess it was probably was a been to by ramen i guess right yeah, i just happened to email over there by, yeah. right or been crush or something i was just like hey you know i really love to email the, the you know the the, the the guys can i do it they're like yeah sure because uh, thankfully one really good thing about living in baltimore is that when you live in new york you're competing with like rolling stone we live in baltimore you're competing with like the the newspaper and the newspaper wasn't interviewing pop punk kids you know <laughs> so yeah like, yeah sure. so you were the one press stop for baltimore <laughs> i was the one press and they're also like hey can you where's the mall and like i remember walking around the mall with like one of the guitar like the guitarist and cobra starship because like they don't know anyone in baltimore you know? exactly like, <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was yeah. like 19 right <laughs> and that's like such a great like i think that that's also a cool thing of using your location or your disadvantage to your advantage because yeah. it's like living in london new york la some of these places you, all of a sudden now your competition is the most established yeah. and the best but like if you're out in baltimore or i don't know really just any cities that maybe yeah. you'd call b markets in mm-hmm. music or whatever all of a sudden you can be the one person that's doing it best or that's helping people yeah. out in your interest and then you become the person yeah that's how i made some of like really good friends growing up was that like they came to our small little club shows and like we were like me and my friend were like, "Hey, do you know anyone here? Do you need food? Do you want to go out? Do you want to you know?" We're yeah. like, "We know yeah. you're in this tiny little market, and you're like sometimes like a Baltimore. Sometimes you're straight up in the hood, and you're Yo. like, hey, don't walk that way. <laughs> um, go that way instead.' You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, I remember there was one time on tour in Baltimore, and I forget the streets. Maybe you know it, but it was downtown, and we had to make it, it was like definitely like because you have like the harbor, and that side of it's really yeah. nice." But then Mm -hmm. you go a little bit further downtown and it gets like bad. And Mm -hmm. we had a show where I needed to deposit a couple thousand dollars cash at an ATM. (laughs) And I'm not kidding. I'm walking and like don't know the city and like kind of have this oh shit moment of like maps didn't really like I accidentally am in a bad spot quickly. And I saw a cop and I was like, hey, uh, I'm just trying to like get here. Like, am I good? You know, the city, whatever. And straight up, the cop was just like, tuck the money in your underwear and keep walking. And I was like, what the <laughs> fuck? Inv- like, what is happening here? He didn't even give you a ride? Oh, no. no. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? That? That's like the... And like acknowledging that it's bad. Acknowledging yeah, being right. like, yo, like, yeah, you look fucking <laughs> sus like you random kid on yeah. tour. Right. And then, oh, God. Before, like, another thing that's interesting, and I will say one thing to make a note of is that like, 
one thing that is very gatekeepy that you can't get around that I never did was like unpaid internships. That is so challenging for various reasons. Like you have to get like proper like work clothes and commute into a part of the city that costs a bunch of money and all of that is super gatekeepy. There's no way around it. And so like sometimes when people are like, oh, you know, just do unpaid internships. Like not everyone can afford doing paid internships because they actually cost money, especially if you're getting college credits because you have to pay for your college credits to work which is crazy. And so I always took the route of just like do the work instead of trying to go through and get the credits and things like that, because essentially I was paying money to work to get internship credits. Wow. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that actually, because you're right. And that can feel like such a valid excuse of like, well, like poor me or like, you know, like I would, but, and you're right. But I also think that that's so worth stating because in all reality, that's not the only way like people make exactly. it through that. You hear that story, but like, any amount of help that you help people with it doesn't need to be an official title. Yeah. Um, like, like because even, the music industry doesn't care that much anyway. They just, like they want to see you've done the work. They don't actually care where you did the work, basically. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's, I'm so glad you said that. That's such a valid point. But yeah, so then that's your early days in Baltimore and getting your start. Here you are living in London. You've moved all over. So was there a moment where you started to feel like a critical mass of it coming together and like real opportunities happening or like, like what happens next from there? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, so I like I said, I, went, I started working at the company that I worked for in undergrad um, full time when I finished school, which was really cool. It was the dream job to have when you're 21 years old. We started at 10, we closed at six, we sold concert tickets. I got a lot of free ones. Um, so I was a really <laughs> fun less. girl to date. Because yeah. I was like, cool, do you want to go see, you know, like, do you want to go see the world? And I'm like, yeah. right? Like, it was super cool, right? So I had a great time. Um, I did that for a few years. I was, it was like a startup. It was like, there was a parent company, but they kind of started their own like branch of the company, essentially. So I was like full-time employee two for the company. So I did a little bit of everything, like logistics, marketing, customer service, reporting and analysis, et cetera. I did it all, right? It was really, really fun. Um, I ended up doing that for three years. Um, I had a really good time doing it. But then I wanted to like, like drill down a bit and like ma marketing I loved. And I was also doing web development. So I started being a web developer when I was young because I wanted a really cool MySpace page, basically. Um, yeah. <laughs> right? So I really wanted a cool MySpace page. I realized that you need to learn how to code. So I learned how to code at like, 15 to have a cool live journal and MySpace page, basically. And so I really wanted yes. to kind of like hone in on those skills because, like, apparently this is a thing people do for jobs now. Fascinating. Um, so, for the only time I've ever not worked in music in my life, um, I worked for the university I graduated from for three years doing web development and digital marketing. And I, thought I got to manage people for the first time doing that as well. Um, and I got my MBA while I was in the first job and then I did my master's in data science and work paid for it because I worked at a university, which was really great too. Cause I really loved that space. And so I did, Sick. that's like the six years post-graduation. I did three at the startup and I did three at, um, the university I graduated from and I was doing like consulting, working with startups. I love like tech, I love tech space and like startup scene a lot. So I did that, um, on the side while I was working at the university. Um, and that's kind of like the six years out from school is what I was busy doing essentially but like I spent three years not in music and I just remember feeling so so like lost I love I my like the people love, love the people I was working with but I felt so lost without being in music like it was yeah. actually kind of tough you know yeah damn but it's interesting because you paid dues there no doubt like getting all of those degrees and everything further and continuing your education and, and putting that on your life resume. Mm -hmm. It's like three years is a long time. And I'm sure you did feel lost. And that was probably weird. But now, what a what a cool thing to have under your belt, and to have in addition. Mm -hmm. So you do that. And then what happens? Did you kind of just hit like a tipping point where you're like, yo, I need to get back to doing something in music? Yeah, so I definitely knew that next was going to be in music. So after I finished my degree in data science, I had been like, literally, I spent seven and a half years in school, basically, like nonstop, almost eight. Um, and I was like, okay, cool. I've done all the things I wanted to do while I was at this company. It's time for me to like, look elsewhere. So I was like, okay, you know, all my friends are in New York. Maybe I'll move to New York. All my friends are in Nashville. Maybe I'll move to Nashville. You know, maybe I'll move to L.A., you know, all the normal places, you know, to quote work in the music industry. Um, and then 2016, Donald Trump got elected. And I was like, oh, oh, no. Well, the U.S. is no longer a viable place to live. No so, fucking right? way you did it. Like, it just, that... Literally, it was like, absolutely not. Like, 
You're the only person I've met that actually fucking did it. Everyone talked yeah. about it. Everyone yeah. talked about it. Everyone was like, if he becomes president, I'm moving. No one fucking yeah. did it. You did it. Oh, yeah. We literally, like, literally. So at this point, at this point, I um, I have a fiance at this point. So I managed to do that. Um, so I'm engaged. Um, and I literally, I'm at the bar. We always went to the bar for the election. So I'm at the bar, right? And, like, the election's happening. It was looking really bad. And it's, like, 2 in the morning. And I'm like, I'm going home. I text my boss. And I was like, okay, I'm like, I'm not coming in tomorrow. Call it a sick day, call it whatever. I'm just not coming in. Husband took the day off too, obviously. So I'm distraught in my living room. And we're literally on Wikipedia. And I am like sorting by what country speaks the most English. And I just start like looking for jobs. Like <laughs> No fucking yeah. way. Right. And so I was just like, no, this is not, this is not a thing. I'm not staying here for any of this nonsense, essentially. Um, oh and if you recall in 2016, it's also the year they did the Brexit vote. And I was planning a wedding. So I didn't have like the geopolitical wherewithal to like figure that out as well. But I was like, this seems also not very good. So the UK was out as an option. So I eliminated the US, I eliminated the UK and I wanted to get back into music. So I was like, cool where on earth am I going to go? My Spanish was not very good. So I, I was like, where am I going to go? Um, and thankfully, um, I have a cousin in Sweden. Um, <laughs> I'm like I know, blown yeah. away right now. Like I'm, I'm like in this story right now. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. So yeah. So literally I are like, literally me and my husband are applying to jobs on like, we're like, we're like, okay, cool. Australia, what's up there? New Zealand had this really cool thing where they were like letting people come to work, et cetera, et cetera. So we're like literally like applying, applying. And I'm like, oh, cool. The Nordics, Nordics speak like, I think the Nordics speak more English per capita than like the U.S. actually. Um, and so I was like, cool. The Nordics seemed like an option and Spotify started in Sweden. So I was like, cool. Well, Sweden is really good with music tech, and I happen to have a data science degree um, and work in music. So I was like, cool, this seems like a viable place. So I call up my cousin, and I'm like, hey, do you like Sweden? So he's Nigerian. Well, I'm Nigerian, but he grew up in Nigeria. He went to grad school in Sweden, married a Swedish girl. And he'd been there for like seven years at the time. Uh, so I called him up. I was like, what's it like? Do you like it? So we literally, like, I hadn't talked to him in like... <sighs> It's probably been a decade. Um, and so I call him up and I'm like, hey. You hey, know? remember me, cousin? <laughs> Basically, right? Um, and so, yeah, it turned out that my husband ended up getting a job offer from a startup. And so we picked up and moved to Sweden at three months after we got married, basically. Like okay. his boss called him to tell him that he got the visa like the day before our wedding as a wedding like present. Yeah. Because I was going to ask you, like, you said that you were engaged at that time, and I would have actually been legitimately sad if you, like, lost a relationship to move. But no, the story gets better, and you together right. agree, this fuck together. this, we're out. We both Get out. married, yeah. ride or die, travel in yep. the world. This is so yep. cool. Literally, we, literally three months after, husband went to Sweden, so because he, he got a job interview, so he went to Sweden once. I stepped foot in Sweden in July of 2017, and I had never been to Sweden before. So I stepped foot in Sweden with all of my belongings after we had like an estate sale to sell all of our things in the States, including like cars and our house. We owned a house, we sold it, et cetera. Like we sold all this stuff basically. And I moved to Sweden never having been there. And the only person I knew there was my cousin who I hadn't seen in 10 years. Thankfully he came to the wedding. So I got to see him then like, Beyond that one time, I the only person I knew in Sweden was my cousin. <laughs> Holy shit. Okay. I mean, like everything about this, like I'm so in on this. Like, I don't even know, I don't even begin to know where to ask, but like what I'm thinking, like just off the top is like, what a bold, crazy fucking risk that not a lot of people would take. How did it go? Like, were you good? Like, how? Because in my head, I'm like, I don't know if I could fucking do that. Like, selling yeah. all of my possessions, committing to that, like, that's really scary. Like, that's that's a big yeah. ask of anyone. So, like, what's that I, like? So yeah, like it's funny because everyone's always like, really, like, oh man, that's such a big thing. And I'm like, I mean, like, really, like, came down to it. I kind of just moved from like a city to another city. It just happened to be across the water, right? They speak a bunch of English. So that wasn't even that huge of an issue. And so I figured it'd be much more jarring for me if I moved to like rural Iowa or something like that probably would be like a solid culture shock. But moving to a place that has like trains and buses and movie theaters and like, you know, I'm like, oh, I'll figure it out. Things are in a different language. But, you know, I have Google Translate. And so like, really, like it wasn't that jarring to move from one city to another. Um, and so like, I figured worst case scenario, if I hated it, like, 
they didn't take my American passport away from me on my way out. So like, I could just go back. Right. You know, like wow. there's, there's nothing stopping me. It's like moving across the country, just moved across an ocean essentially. And so like, it was, it was like, it was really interesting because it was a reset I needed because between planning a wedding and like the election, I was just like anxious and stressed, like all the time, basically. And I was and, like, I also, I just finished seven and a half years of school. Right. Yeah, so like, fuck. I was just like drained, like just completely drained. And I really wanted to reset. And so it was like also the perfect reset. Um, I didn't know it was going to take me six months to find a job. Um, as I arrived in Sweden with three degrees. And at this point, I don't know seven years of experience something like that so i was like oh yeah it should be super easy to find a job why would it be hard it took me six months oh um God. that was really tough um i don't think i even knew how much my identity was wrapped in my career until i did yeah. not have a career essentially and i was doing freelance work so i was making the same salary i was making in the states just doing freelance work i still had clients things like that it wasn't okay, quite good. the same of like having a place to go and a place to right. be and like so did that for six months and then I got a job at Universal, um, Universal Sweden. Funny enough, I okay. applied for a different job and then they were like, Hey, do you you seem really qualified for this job? I'm like, Yeah, I'll do that. You know, <laughs> like and it was wow. actually really, really fun for a while. I spent a year and a half, almost two years there basically, and Universal Sweden happens to have all of the artists you think of when you think of Swedish artists. So ABBA, Avicii, Tovalo, Robin, like those were all universal Sweden. So it was amazing Whoa. all the time. Like random members of ABBA were in the office all the time. It was great. Um, so it did was you, very cool. Did you also have like a moment, like I'm kind of thinking about this now and I'm like, okay, cool. So you had the competitive advantage in Baltimore because you were the person. Did you stand out once you were the American in Sweden? Like, did you bring something new to the table and have like this, oh, well, I mean, like, Christine knows this because she's from the States. And like, did that give you like a, like kind of like a cool advantage? Yeah, actually. Um, um, so, I mean, my biggest advantage is I don't speak Swedish, obviously. So that was a challenge. I did learn it's a, it's a democratic socialist country. So they actually have free Swedish lessons for 18 months when you arrive. Because of, of course, course they do. <laughs> <laughs> Completely free, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's funny because I always joke that the CEO of um, University of Sweden at the time, he would just like roll me into like meetings as like, this is the American and knows math. Uh, and I'm like, hello, everybody. <laughs> So I sat in all kinds of really fun meetings. Like I was in contract negotiations. I sat in chat, you know, with artists a lot. You know, I did a lot of in the space because not only did I have the competitive advantage of like being from the States, but I also like, again, new math. Um, and like, no offense to people in the music industry, but generally, unless you're actually working in finance, you, people tend to avoid math. That's usually why yeah. they got into the yeah. music industry. Um, you so know? you could really look at numbers and you could bring like <laughs> yeah. a very analytical side to meetings. But I can also talk to artists and talk to managers because I spent my I've spent the past yeah. what, at that point. Ooh, that's a good combo. years talking to managers and talking to artists. So like instead of showing them a graph, I'd make a mood board. You know, instead of you know showing you know like a graph, I'd make you know show a timeline. I just did different things to kind of like show you know put this in a language that the artist would actually understand that was actually you know compelling to them and talk to them about their careers. So I talked with so many of our artists about their careers and the trajectory. And I sat in on like contract negotiations and talked to them about, hey, this is what we can do for you. And like all kinds of stuff, look at artist audiences and all kinds of things like that, all in Sweden, basically. So with the artists, like like artists coming to Sweden and talking to them about like, hey, this is how, you, this is how the Swedish market works. And then also like when we're trying to like export artists to like working like, you know, an Alesso project or working a Robin project, and, like, cool, like how do we get this outside of Sweden? I was doing all of that. Um, and I had yeah, that advantage of like knowing how the music industry worked outside of Sweden, um, which was really helpful. And I will say one thing that I think in terms of like that question you asked about competitive advantage, I think yeah. that's one of the things I always tell people about the music industry when they go to apply for jobs. I always say, find something that you are uniquely qualified to do. So yeah. for example, when Ooh. I was in Sweden, we had an export team. The export team, their job was to get Robin, Abici, Abba, Tovalo outside of Sweden, right? And at the time, that team was entirely immigrants because it didn't really matter if they understood Sweden per se, but it mattered way more than they understood the rest of the world. So if you come to Sweden and you're really interested in music, it's a really good place to be if you're an immigrant to be on the exports team, right? Um, and so like, yeah. I always tell people when they're looking at the music industry to find that thing that makes you like top 10% of the people that are applying because of something very unique and special about you. Like, wow. for example, being an immigrant or let's say, you know, working at, who are a student athlete working at a management company that does athletes and musicians. 
So you might yeah. end up on the athlete start to start off with, but you have a full understanding of what it's like to be a student athlete at this pivotal time which we're going to get signed to a management company, for example. So if you think about it from that perspective, it's a lot easier to break in if you have something unique that makes you the person that they must have for that role, essentially. That is such great advice. And it's such like, a, it's almost no brainer advice, but it's like, maybe you you don't give yourself credit or understand how valuable that is. Like I instantly think of Alexa Villarreal who works at Spotify and she did an episode and she like the episode was titled like embracing fandom in the music industry. And we talked so much about like she was just a genuine fan of One Direction and Five Seconds of Summer and like did the things like she won the, the street team contests and was full in it, ran a Twitter and then that, just her love for those artists and understanding how to speak fan and like really, really owning that got her the job that she has at Spotify. And she's so good at it where it would be so easy to be like, oh, like me, like knowing what it's like to sit in line to get front row tickets or like all these like things where you're like, that's not a professional skill. Or maybe you discredit that companies need that like companies but it is. like like you need to be able to speak to your demographic and your audience. So if you love something, there's a strong chance that you're the most valuable candidate. And if you have a specific niche interest, like my God, like all of a sudden that's, that's huge. Yeah, exactly. Like that's something that I think people just kind of underestimate so much. It's like that thing that makes you special. Like everyone has to be makes them special. Like use that to your advantage. Don't like, like, I think sometimes people try to hide it away or things like that. Like, there's a whole thing about fandom and, like, trying to pretend yeah, that you're not fuck, a fan. Yeah, fuck, yeah, That sucks. Um, but, like, pretending that you're not the person that you are, it, like, puts you in a crap situation for life anyway. So, like, yeah. not really helpful. But, like, use that to your advantage. It's always better. And I always, like, I knew I was the immigrant that did not, you know, speak any Swedish. Also, let's be real here. Uh, the demographic of Sweden does not look like me. I do a lot of podcasts. <laughs> I am an African-American woman. Um, and so, like... <laughs> Like, I had friends that would come visit, like, oh, I heard that the Swedes wear a lot of, like, dark colors because, you know, and so I'm going to wear dark colors to blend in. And I'm like, I'm not going to blend in pretty much no matter what I do. So I'm going to go ahead and just wear pink. Um, yeah, you know, fucking like, amazing. Just, like, just embrace it, right? Just, like, yeah. you have to embrace it sometimes because eventually you're going to be found out anyway. Whatever that thing is that you're trying to avoid or try not to do, you're going to be found out. So you might as well just embrace it, right? Totally. I remember going to Japan and being like tall white kid and then being like, hmm. like, it's just like you instantly know that feeling where you're like, I am not like most of them. I am here. the other. <laughs> yeah. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just yeah. funny to notice. Yeah. Damn. I think it's better that way. I mean, like it makes things a bit more interesting, right? You know? Yeah, totally. And like, that's, I just love that. I love your view on that. And I love that you didn't try to fit in and you're like, I am who the fuck I am and I'm going to use that. So, oh my God, Universal, Sweden, you actually moved in 2016. Incredible. Your husband and you are there. Like, wow. I mean, here you are. You still haven't returned to the States, have you? No. Well, now I'm in London. Um, Right. (laughs) So um, I always joke that I got tired of being cold and eating fish. Um, <laughs> Sweden's a really smart market. So Sweden, the population of Sweden is like 10 million people. And if you include the rest of the Nordic, something like 25 mil. Um, and so I wanted a bigger market. Um, I wanted to work on a new projects and things like that. And so, I mean, at the time I moved over to London, they were still figuring out the whole Brexit thing, but I felt a little bit more comfortable to come on over. Um, and so I moved to London in... Um, 2019 july 2019 um okay. so two years after i got to sweden moved to london basically and i got a job at warner cool. um and so i worked at warner music group um in london i started off on the chief data officers team um and then i moved to the chief marketing officers team so by the time i left essentially i was on the global marketing team and we decided the priorities for warner music group as a whole so that's like cardi b ed sheeran bruno mars but also like up and coming artists like burner boy from nigeria anita from brazil like ash nico ava max etc so we were in charge of like marketing globally those artists essentially so we work all different markets around the world um of course i took this job thinking oh man i can't wait to travel so much with my new global marketing job Uh, (laughs) i know what's coming started that job was the day our company shut the doors we all started working from home yeah (laughs) ironically the day we started going back to the office again was the day before my last day at that job so I literally spent the entirety of that job at my dining room table essentially but it was really cool um to get to work the priorities like literally like the conversations and decisions we made literally was like 
we would make a decision in our team that the rest of Warner Music or its recorded side had to action on, which was really, really cool, right? You know, like, yeah, oh my so God, we that's got amazing. to say, like, especially like upcoming artists, we got to say, cool, this upcoming artist, you know, Burner Boy, Anita, like, that's going to be a gold priority, which is incredible because the one thing that I found most exciting about that job was like getting to change what a global superstar looked like. Because, I, you know, I'm from the US, I've lived in the UK, there's amazing talent there, but there's amazing talent all over the world. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I think the music industry and the charts should reflect what the world looks like. And the world does not look like the US and the UK. The world is not just white pop stars, right? Holy there's so much more than that. Shit. And so like yeah. getting to like to the whole world, getting to disseminate, you know, Lizzo, getting to put Lizzo's naked body in Times Square, you know, <laughs> getting to getting to like, you know, work a Burner Boy album, like a Nigerian artist across the world, you know, getting to work a Brazilian artist, Anita around the world, or Ash Nico, who is like incredibly weird like like yeah. incredibly weird but so cool right so cool Getting to do that felt so amazing right and like that was really like when people were like oh was it really cool to work the ed sheeran now i'm like ed sheeran was going to be fine with or without me <laughs> you know, like, yeah it's totally. so like, like he's doing fine you know but really it's like getting to like my i always joke my parents were only like i worked at sheeran bruno mars you know etc only time they were impressed with myself was breaking Burner Boy because I'm Nigerian. Um, and he's Nigerian. He's like the star of Nigeria, you know? That's cool. It's like, though. that was cool, right? That yeah. was really cool. That was like the thing I love most about the job, really. Right. No, but again, like that, that is really, really cool. And it must be super validating. And like, again, being in a spot where you're like, like so fucking qualified to speak on global diversity because it's like you've lived this like it. <laughs> it, it, you're the fan of music you've seen it all you've come from all these different spaces and now all of a sudden like your unique perspective makes you so qualified to work in that and to do something that is such a great step for music and so necessary. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because like I mentioned earlier, you know, I have a bunch of degrees um, for the record. I always caveat, you do not need one degree, yet alone three to work in the music industry. So please do not take my lead. Yeah. <laughs> um, however, <laughs> I got all these degrees. And so my undergrad degree is in music business. My MBA was in marketing and I did my master's in data science. And so up until two months ago, I was the director of data and insights for the Warner Music Group's global marketing team. So I really kind of nailed it in terms of like, you know, using all those degrees, which was pretty cool, right? <laughs> yeah, damn, that aligns well. That's nuts. One other thing that I want to talk about, like, so that's like career and like, what a crazy story. And ugh, man, there's, there's more that we could go into there. I feel like I'm barely scratching the surface, but I, there's, there's so much that I'm interested about you. Mm -hmm. Another really big thing that stood out to me in your story is the conference and the group and, and your initiative to help people get jobs in the industry and like you yeah. actually doing something about that. Like, tell me about that because I'm so interested and I actually don't know that much. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, I run this conference hackathon called Measure of Music. Um, I put it on this year, back in February, essentially for the first time. And it's because during COVID, like a bunch of people would reach out to me, you know, they're like, hey, I'm really interested in working in the music industry. And like, I have a ca my calendar set aside Monday nights, actually normally this time, um, I have talked to two people, um, two new people about the industry. They reach out, I give them my calendar link, they pick a time every Monday night. I've done this for like over a year now. Um, but my calendar is always really booked up in advance, like six weeks in advance. Usually I feel I really bad about it. I fucking love that. <laughs> Are you serious? You yeah, just said that yeah, and like, yeah. fuck, that's cool. So yeah, I thought like, I was like, cool. I, I, I'm like, if I can, I can give back, you know, during COVID, like my job was completely secure. I did not feel more, any more anxious than anyone else besides, you know, my, I was secure. So I was like, what can I do to give back? And so I did this, you know, I've been doing it for, gosh, now, like probably over a year, basically I've had this calendar and it was always really booked up. So I felt really bad that I'm like, yeah, we can talk in six weeks, but I also have to be mindful of my time. Yeah. So I was like, cool, what can I do to, what can I do that's better basically? And so I came up with this idea of this conference and the hackathon basically. So it was like a workshop where it was like a crash course and like all the things that I've used in the music industry. And like, I was, whenever I was talking to people, I would talk about, it wasn't wanting to get in data. I was talking about like, oh, check out chart metric, check out Spotify's API, check out, you know, I'd name all these different companies. And so I was like, what if I just brought all my friends together and like, they just talked to them about all of these things instead of me talking to them all the time, essentially. And so that yeah. was the general idea. Um, went on sale. Well, on sale, I went live with the idea. It was literally like a Google form. Um, <laughs> I'm a web developer. So I made a website. 
kept my, you know, my, so my industry chop. to say that. Like I can feel the way you think it's like went on sale. Wait, actually it was just a Google right. link. It went it was live. A Google form. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We did not go on sale with anything. <laughs> um, so I put up a Google form basically and like I put together a website and, um, all the spots for the hackathon filled up in like 24 hours, basically. I like I thought like 50 people would be interested. It seemed like a really niche topic about music and data, really. Yeah. But filled up all the spots. Um, and so I was like, cool, let me expand this a bit. So I made it like three days because I'm a glutton for punishment and like give myself extra work. Um, <laughs> and so I decided to put together a three-day conference. So I had 25 speakers, you know, end up with like 75 people did the actual hackathon. So they spent the whole weekend working on a music data project within groups of like five, six people basically had judges from companies like, you know, like, like SoundCloud, Warner, et cetera, that were judging. I had speakers from like TikTok, Linkfire, like Warner, like I think AWOL, for example, I had speakers from all over as well. Right. Um, and they just went through the whole weekend and like they put together a project and they presented them to a panel of judges basically on the last Sunday night, basically. Um, and what was really, really cool about it was that the participants and the speakers were majority minority in both gender and race. And that Sick. was super important to me. And it happened entirely organically because that's what my network looks like, right? And those are the people that are reaching out to me that wanted to help. I wanted to make sure when they looked on the virtual stage, they saw people that looked like them. So that was really important. So also yeah. a lot of the speakers were like under 30 years old. Some, I think two or three of the speakers had never spoken at an event or a panel before, which is also Props. important. Because yeah tired of hearing the same i'm tired of even hearing myself sometimes i'm tired of hearing the same people talk all the time so it was really important to, like get new people's voices heard and things like that so i'm doing it again in february I actually announced it like literally today um but the next one is going to be february um 25th to 27th same thing but with more if the world yeah. persists we're even going to have in-person places where people can work on the hackathon together IRL. Um, and yeah, so I'm really excited about it essentially. So that's what I do with all of the spare time that I allegedly have. Yeah. God, I, I, I don't know. I just, I really like that. I feel like there's so many things in your story that I'm now learning is like kind of what that thing that we first said is like, it's just doing it right. Like it's so easy to look for the opportunities and to ask and this and that. And ultimately you kind of just got to do it. And you're just like, yeah, fuck it. Like Monday nights, here's my calendar. And it's like, oh, how can I do that bigger? Here's this. And it's like, I don't know. That's It's just really fucking inspiring. And it, it's it's cool. Like it's as much as it, I feel, I was going to say it's relatable as much as I have not moved to Sweden or the UK or anything like that. Like I just, I feel, I so directly relate to those points in your career and the times and those crossroads and maybe similar upbringing or uh, roots in the music industry. So hearing your path and seeing the things you've done and the action that you've taken to like make your life not suck and also help other people, like I really fucking respect it. It's cool. I'm inspired by it. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Like literally, I'm just like, I feel like I'm just like a little warped to our kid that like decided to like move abroad basically. Like every day I feel like, oh yeah, I guess I'm doing this. <laughs> you know, really yeah. cool. like all I want to do is like literally I always say I'm like I always joke that everything I do is really selfish actually in terms of giving back. It's because like I want to be in a music industry that doesn't suck. Like I don't want to be surrounded by people that suck. And so whatever I can do to make it make me be surrounded by people that don't suck, especially smart people that don't suck. I will literally do whatever it takes to do that because it's like chances are, you know, I'm gonna be doing this. I'm going to be in this industry for probably like what 20 more years or something like that. Like, do I want to be surrounded by like unhappy, ungrateful, cynical people for 20 years? Yeah. Of course not. So, like, why not do the things to make the like the world, whatever small beacon of the world you can better so that when you look around, you're not surrounded, like you're not surrounded by people that you hate basically. God, I feel that so heavily. I mean, that's like such a massive inspiration of this podcast is like, my experiences in the music industry, there was so many antiquated ideas and gatekeepy bullshit and, and just Lucky like people. all these things. And like, I, I kind of went from managing artists and feeling like this isn't enough, like what I'm going to ultimately help three artists, whatever. It was like, maybe I can just do a podcast and hopefully sharing other people's stories will make like we'll share new cool ideas and hopefully inspire the next generation to pick that torch up and make it not suck because it does not have to. And there's so many yeah. bright, amazing people doing the raddest shit and the future of music looks so dope. And it's really reaffirming to to meet someone like yourself and be like, oh, wow. Yeah, cool. Like same exact vibe. That's awesome. Yeah. Vibes, right? That's yeah. what it comes down to. And like, I think the podcast is fantastic because like when I look 
I really love like when you look through like all the guests that you've had on the podcast, it's like people that you don't always hear from. It's not like the same, like, you know, it's not the same, like 20 people in the industry. Like it's not the same CEO, you know, whatever. It's like real people. Like they're actually like, they're doing the actual work and hearing them doing the actual work is absolutely incredible. And I think that's like, that's what's going to make it better. That's what's going to make this industry that we've worked in better. So I, I always, I was talking to a friend the other day. I was really sad that like kids these days don't have Warped Tour. I'm like, yeah. where's your community? Yeah. Um, so yeah. we have to build a community, right? You know? Yeah. Thank you for <laughs> noticing that too, because I feel like it's, it definitely is not the easy way to get a ton of downloads and grow something, mm-hmm. but I just like miss me with doing the same interview with the same people over and over again. That was my problem with it. It was like, when I was looking to learn more and advance my career in the music industry, I didn't need to hear from the most popular lead singer. I wanted to hear from the people behind the scenes that made that all possible. And it was very rare to find information there. So so the more I can share stories of those people, the happier I am. Uh, when is When are you making a podcast? Because I feel like with everything you're setting up, what's up? <laughs> What's up? Oh, Do it, please. Oh, I have no more free time. My husband would divorce me if I decided to start a Boy to Star for our podcast. If I could, though. Man, <laughs> well, I feel like I like if 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 people have specific questions, like I feel like I'd, I'd love to have you back on and like. I don't know. I just I think that there's a lot that you could speak to really well. And I love your the way you share this. And obviously, like you're doing everything you're doing right now. So maybe the better question is. Uh, how does somebody get involved with your projects? Where can they find you and and where can they further reach out if they directly related to your story and want to want to get more involved? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I don't Instagram, um, so don't you will not find me there, but I am on LinkedIn. Um, mm-hmm. I have a website. It's just my name, christine.osazo.com. If you want to check out Measure of Music, it's measureofmusic.com. Um, that's where you can find me. Feel free to reach out. I will always respond. It will take a while probably, but I will definitely respond. So definitely reach out. That's awesome. I, I like everything, everything here. I, I love it. I love it. I, I, it was, this happens all so often where I'll have a feeling about a guest. I'll see the things and I'm like, yeah, it looks like you're doing cool stuff. But there's something very special about your story where hearing every little step of it and hearing and seeing the actual action you've taken to make music suck less and to make it better all around is really fucking cool. And it's such an honor to have someone like yourself on this show. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for this outlet. Thanks for bringing cool people on the show. Like, it's great. Thank you so much. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Well, there it is. I really appreciate it. There you go, Christine's story. I'll make sure to link all of the proper contact info for her in the episode description. If you want to get involved in anything she's doing, it'll all be there. Thank you so much for listening. As always, if you made it here to the end and you found this helpful, do me a big favor and share it with somebody else that would enjoy it. Really, the biggest way that this podcast has grown has been entirely from word of mouth. And it's also built this incredible community of like-minded listeners and people that get value out of this. So share it with a friend that you think would like it. If you absolutely love the podcast and you want to go above and beyond, there is a Patreon, patreon.com slash where are all my friends. I make sure to include a lot of like behind the scenes bonus clips of episodes and extra stuff there. Any amount of support is massively helpful, but really the the big thing that that anyone can do and is entirely free is just sharing this episode. So if you're here at the end, post it on social, text it to a friend, anything, make sure to hit up Christine. She's amazing. And let me know who else you want to hear from. I'll be back next week with another episode.